Friday, Just Baseball Show. It is episode 101 here on November 19th. Let's power rank 101s. Uh, three options. Episode 101, Zoe 101, and 101 Dalmatians. <sighs> One through three. three, Peter, go. Zoe 101 is better than our podcast. Sorry, just yeah. Zoe 101, legendary show. Yeah. I'm going our podcast too. I think we fit in there pretty fairly. Because I'm just not that big of a fan of 101 Dalmatians. When I was young, the main woman, uh, what's her name? You know it. Cruella DeVille. Cruella DeVille. Or uh, that felt like a different. I know. I I was, that was a fire from the hip. I could be that. But I think she like gave me nightmares when I was young. If I remember correctly. So I'm 101 Dalmatians is easy three. We're two and a respectable two. Yeah. We just don't beat zoe 101 and i think it's fair arm what you think zoe by a landslide i yeah. watched that show that was one of those shows when you know when you're in like middle school you pretend that you don't watch it because you're yeah. embarrassed but all of your friends also watch it but nobody talks about watching it because nobody wants to take the chance that everybody's like whoa you watched that that's a great point i carly another one of those. that one of course i watched it we all watched it but because it's pretend, funny we all pretended that we didn't you guys had some toxic masculinity flowing through your schools, huh? I mean, I, I watched it openly. I was like, yes, I'm going to go home and watch Zoe 101, Victorious. Uh, absolutely. I got into Victorious. I grew, I, up in South, I grew up in South Florida. There was a lot more toxic things go- going into the youth <laughs> around here, bro. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it was, it was not good. High judgment, high judgment. And I, I secretly watched that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Older sister. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, I had a, uh, or I still have a meme folder. Like I've got, you know, a, a photo album in my photos app of memes. And it's, you know, I think a little bit over a hundred photos. And one of them is a photo of Chase, just like smiling. I that because is. I think it's pretty funny at times. Like the situation, when the situation calls for it, I think just a photo of Chase Matthews is pretty fun. And I'm going to text both of you as soon as this podcast is over. But... Before we get into a laundry list of baseball items, we're going to go rapid fire through a lot of things because we just did the all MLB teams. You know, we went through the gold gloves. We went through the Cy Youngs. We went through the, all the awards. We kind of left a lot of smaller things by the wayside. And of course we're into speculation season. We're going to get into that. But first, Aram, oh, you no. have the fix for the national hockey league. You think you could step in as the Florida Panthers GM and win a Stanley cup right now. Why? Yes. Well, I love the before you answer just how he teed that up. <laughs> like, well, it's just... take it as is this because you know hockey's. My, I'm least knowledgeable about hockey, but I, the more I've studied the sport, the more I'm realizing you know what goes into it. And now that my Panthers are the best team in hockey, you know I just yeah. keep watching more and more games. Naturally. And the more that I'm learning is how much there is to be gained at the goalie position. And if you just got a sumo wrestler who has the diameter. And just a general mass that covers the entire goal, right? The, the hockey goal, the NHL goal, regulation size, we have humans that big. So imagine you have a human that big. All you need is for him to get on skates and do a little thing where he just shovels the, the puck out. How are you scoring? He takes up the whole thing. It's just going to hit him every time. I win the Stanley Cup. We never give up a goal ever. And we just have to keep him just in good enough shape where he you know, is okay with all the gear on. But also can still be big enough to cover the whole goal. I, I am expecting a call in the next week or so from the Panthers or whatever hockey team I'm open to anything. Um, and, and if I have to leave the podcast, I do, but I think I have something here. Yeah. You know what that kind of reminds me of? Um, if we're talking, if we relate it to baseball, Eddie Goodell, three foot yeah. seven, shortest yeah. baseball player ever drew the walk. I mean, we could consider a full team of those. I mean, imagine the ex Woba on them. Imagine yeah, they banned it. They banned it. You know what, you know what would happen? They would, they would ban my, my idea because it, it was, it was so good. It was too smart. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They would you can't just solve you. hockey in one fell swoop. You got to give it some years, you know, provide the data. You can't just come in with all the correct takes all of a sudden. Yeah. People might I, think you're, you know, some sort of psychic kind of like the witch burnings, you know, you could be looked at like that. Well, Peter, quick follow-up to the Eddie Goodell thing. Uh, there was a workaround to that after they banned it. Uh, it was called David Eckstein when David Eckstein <laughs> just got into a crouch and like made the strike zone like six inches. 
<laughs> Altuve does that sort of, but he just, he's like one of the better power hitters in baseball. Um, my, my thought to, uh, go against Aram sumo goalie idea is just take the horse that is deemed too wild to be a racehorse, throw them in the, uh, in the gates of the Kentucky Derby. So they're just going to be, they're going to shoot out like a bat out of hell when they get out of the gates. But instead of a jockey, just throw like a newborn baby on there. Like they're only eight pounds or so. So, I mean, there's nothing weighing that horse down. Like that is a derby winning horse. See, the difference is, is mine's actually a good idea. <laughs> These are all great ideas. All, all make sense. And this is why people tune in for our smartness, yeah. our intelligence. I, I've got another great idea to throw your way. Uh, All right, yeah, let's from... keep talking great ideas before baseball, the Just Baseball show. Well, this is a great baseball idea. It's not okay. from me. It's from Eric Neander. Oh, Apparently, the Rays are looking into about a 10-year extension, somewhere in the 150 to 200 range for Wander Franco. MLB Trade Rumors had it. Um, there was a reporter in the Dominican that, that had the number at 10 years, 150 to 200. I think that would set a Rays record. They have never handed out money. If they're going to hand money out to someone ever, like they've picked the right guy to hand money to, 10 years, 200. Let's highball it a little bit. Let's go to the max of what was floated. I say yes. And I tweeted my thoughts on that. Um, I pretty much said that, you know, Wander doesn't hit arbitration until 2025. He doesn't hit the open market until 2028. It's still November of 2021. If you can get $20 million annually for the next 10 years and you bypass the entirety of arbitration and you bypass two more years of making $540,000 or so, I say do it. I think that's a deal that I say yes to if I'm Wander's agent. Aram, you go first. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. That that was something we talked about in the staff chat. And you know, people referenced the Acuna deal. That was for eight years, 100. So it's a little bit less. My big problem with the Acuna deal was that it has two club options after the six years. That probably wouldn't be the case here, right? Like these are guaranteed years and or player options. I don't know how Acuna was guided into that. When you look at it here, though, you know, this is going to be his first full season, really. Uh, so he would have had two seasons. We talk about control. Arbitration, though, as you perform each year, you can make a little bit more at least. You're still making significantly less than 20 million. But for the next two years, Wander would be making league minimum. So that's the big, big jump, right? Instead of a million dollars over the next two seasons, he could be making 40. That is such a big difference and a life changing difference that I think you got to take it. It's not like they're lowballing him, like he's getting so much money before proving himself to the degree that most people have to prove themselves at the major league level. I, on both sides, love it. I, I would do it if I'm the Rays because you're a team that you know you'll be priced out of Wander Franco if you don't do it now. So this is the best move for them to be able to keep their superstar. And for Wander, this is a life-changing amount of money. And then you're going to hit free agency at 30, 31 and be able to go get your mega contracts again. It, it's, it's a no-brainer, I think, for both sides. I agree. I would do it as well. My only, you know you know, just stay away a little bit is that some of these contracts haven't worked all the way in the past. The John Singleton contract that we talked about with Houston, when they signed him to a long-term deal before he really made any big major league impact. Same with the Seattle Mariners when they did that with Evan White, but we point to the Acuna deal. So sometimes it does work. Sometimes it doesn't, but I wouldn't say that like no player is an absolute lock to be a superstar ever. You know, injuries can happen. Things can falter. But if we're looking at somebody in baseball, who we think is that guy, Wander Franco is at the top of that list. That's why I'm also good with giving him 10 years, 200, even though really that's an incredible amount of money for a 20-year-old who has played 70 Major League Baseball games. Yeah, he, here's the thing. If you sign 10 years with Tampa right now, Wander Franco is missing out on the first four years in the open market. So if everything goes right for him in his career, he could be looking at 35 to $40 million annually, also, at least. Just, I mean, talk about in 10 years, what if the market then resets and now he really is getting 45, 50? Right. That could be a thing so, to, in 10 years. What does the money look like? 
Right. So you play that what if, but we're playing that what if thinking about Wander in all the right ways. You know, we're not saying what if he gets hurt? What if the bat tails off? What if he starts swinging and missing? Like, I I don't think we have any doubt that he's not going to keep barreling baseballs and like turn into one of the best players in the game in a very short while. Um, if everything goes right, then you could be missing out on a little bit of money. But the reality is, if you hit some bumps in the road, you're guaranteeing yourself $200 million in your bank account by the time you turn 31 years old. And I know we wanted to do rapid fire, but I just want to throw this last question to you guys. How much is too much for Wander? What is the peak that you give him? Because that's an interesting question, right? Would you go up to 250? Would you go up to 12 years? Where is the cap on when you're like, all right, hold the brakes? I'd max it at 250. So you would give him 10 for 250. I would. Here's what I would do. Much fucking money. Oh my God. I'm the raise. No. You have to. I think you have to. I would do 10 for 220 with the back two years being player options. Mm -hmm. I think 200 is a fair deal for both sides. I think 200 is where I, you know, cap. But if you're putting player options in there, you're you're essentially just doubling down on what your risk is. The only way that Wander's taking those player options is if he sucks or if he's hurt or if, if his value is tragically diminished. So I would, I would lean club option if anything at that point, or a mutual option, excuse me, if anything, but it, it's, it's a really weird spot. I would go 250 just because he might give you $25 million value next year. Uh, and, and that's the thing. $25 million that, value this year. Yeah, Exactly. And I would, I would be willing to take that chance uh, given his profile. I mean, he's an unprecedented type of talent and you could also backload it. You can incentivize it. You can get so creative. Uh, I, I would put huge all-star MVP incentives in the back end, And I, I think they can make it work and get creative. And I'm excited to kind of see how this unfolds, but how about just good on the raise for, for Finally. doing something a little different. Let's do it. Uh, and, and putting a little bit more money into into their team, hopefully. So hopefully they do it. It took LeBron James to do it to him. I mean, like it took 20-year-old superstar Wander yeah. Franco to do it to him. Yeah. Um, we are at flight tracking season pretty much. Like we are looking at where the charters are going at what times, uh, what college towns they're leaving. Uh, so we just saw a photo of Carlos Correa and AJ Hinch having lunch in Houston. Like this is gossip. This is how bro machismo dudes gossip. They look at lunch dates between AJ Hinch and Carlos Correa. Uh, Pete, you and I both had Correa signing with the Tigers. Different numerical amounts in in terms of annual value, in terms of total value of the contract, but this is a good sign. It's a great sign. It makes all the sense in the world. I mean, I could just go through every single point again, why it makes sense, but I feel like I've done it so many times. But A.J. Hinch, former manager, three best prospects. They ain't shortstops. They have pitching. They have money to spend. This is a Tigers team that's not the Pirates. You know, they will spend. They have been a competitive team. And it was interesting today. I saw that. I don't know if you guys saw that. Now they have five Cy Youngs currently playing in baseball that are all not on the Tigers anymore. Five with Robbie Ray winning the Cy Young. That's incredible. But yeah, I think it's a great sign. And I think he will sign with the Astros. And I I said it was a bold take on the episode. And then on the comment section, people are like, that's not a bold take. Well, it was a bold take when we said it in August. And we're just, you know, furthering that. So now it might not be as bold anymore, but it was bold at one point. What do you think, Aram? You know... I think that the Hinch to Correa combination was always something that makes sense, obviously, because Hinch it was leaving on good terms with his players, right? The Hinch, Hinch and the players didn't have a problem. He wasn't underperforming in, in his job capacity. It was more just clearing out whatever they could do in terms of optics. Obviously, Correa and Hinch get along well. I'm sure the conversation was a lot of, you know, how long do I have to wait until this team's going to be competitive? I, I like the move for the Tigers. I can see it happening big time, but you, let's be real with the Correa situation. It's going to be whoever bids the most. And are the Tigers going to bid the most? 
we'll have to see. They already paid Eduardo Rodriguez a nice chunk of change. I think that the Tigers might get priced out, uh, but but that's just my guess. But if they really, really want to make a splash here, they, they could go do it. I just don't think it makes sense for them if they have to go way overboard when you can go get a Marcus Semien potentially. I don't know if he wants to play there. I know he wants to be on the West Coast. But if you can get a Marcus Semien for cheaper and not, not handcuff yourself as much to a player who's injury prone when you're a, a rebuilding team still, I don't know if it totally makes sense for them. You know, I think it's exciting. I, I think it's, it's a really cool concept that a, a rebuilding team could go do this and then kind of uh, expedite the rebuild. But I don't know if it necessarily makes the most sense because giving Carlos Correa eight years is still risky. This is a guy that is, has rarely played more than 120 games. That's not and being I talked the Tigers, about. I, I don't think the Tigers can afford to, to, to miss on that. You kind of did the transition for me. Um, I was going to loop Erod into the conversation because the Tigers just dropped big money for if everything works out according to plan, they're four. It would be Mize is the ace. It would be Manning as the two. It would be Scooble as the three. And then it would be Erod as the four. You guys are both shaking your head. Erod's the two, like E-Rod's no doubt. Two. He might even be the one at this point. I mean, not, he's not better than Mize, I wouldn't say. But, but for the good. length of the contract, you think he's the two? Right now, what have you seen from Matt Manning where you're like, that dude is for sure going to be a mainstay in this rotation? I like Scooble. Projects to be better than Erod. Does he at this point? I think so. I just watch him and I'm like, I don't know what I like. He's been pretty bad. Dude, he's a rookie. But regardless, he's going to be in their rotation for a while. And the thing about Erod, and I feel like we saw this with the market, even with Andrew Heaney signing an eight and a half million dollar deal. The there was three pitchers this year. Sarah Langs tweeted this out: the largest gap between actual and expected ERA. Andrew Heaney, five point eight three ERA, expected three nine eight. Aaron Nola. 4.63 ERA, 3.37 expected ERA. Eduardo Rodriguez, 4.74 ERA, expected 3.52. So I feel like we saw on the market a lot of these teams go after guys who maybe their ERA was pretty terrible, but they're obviously seeing some underlying metrics that they really like. And I mean, you're taking a guy that, if we're referencing baseball savants park factor, he's going from. Mm-hmm. the second most hitter friendly ballpark to you know one of the eight or so most pitcher friendly ballparks if, if you really want to double down on that I mean that should really transition into success for him and I think it will I think Erod's going to be really good uh, with them I mean the guy averaged 10.5 strikeouts per nine and, and he had the best year command wise of his career obviously there was some bad luck there you are what your performance ultimately demonstrates but there's a lot of reason to believe that he will be a lot better next year when I look at the rookies I'm honestly more concerned about those guys like I thought Tarek Skubal who I I was most skeptical of is now the guy I'm the most confident in and and that kind of shows you how fluid fluid this situation is I don't like Mize oh I think Mize oh I think Mize is is a big league starter a back-end guy and he's 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 kind of just fine Mm, uh, I I just disagree with you. I on that. Do I like Mize a lot. What does he what, what does he excel at? Please He's got me. his splitter went on as a top 10 pitch in baseball. Yeah, and if that's the case then why is he striking out 7 per 9? Cuz he's young. He's going to figure it out. Like I, I don't think so. I, I legitimately don't think so. Like Wow, I, I just disagree with you. I, like you look you look at the expected stats there too. I mean like he got away with so much loud contact, got just barreled and barreled and barreled. Seven strikeouts per nine in today's game is is atrocious. It's a step back from 2020. His velo has never quite gotten back to where it was. He's had on and off shoulder issues. The splitter, you say it's a great pitch, gets it's, it got barreled to hell in 2020. I think that, you know, we're, we're holding on to the, the former number one pick, Casey Mize, and not the fact that, that he has not been – that dude, since he got promoted to double A, he just hasn't. And I think the numbers will back that up and the starts. I mean, he just has not been good. Peter, are you changing your mind? That's what your eyes say. Like, kind of. Dude, oh, my God. His savant page is so blue. Yes. So bad. His expected ERA this year was 496 compared to his 371. He only struck out 118 guys in 150 innings. It's the only terrible. thing that he does, he doesn't walk guys, which I like. The pitches still seem fine. I mean, off the fastball, 224 average, sliders 
everyone's hitting 195, the splitter 203. It's the sinker that just got beat up this year. And, and opponent's guess hitting what? 322 against the sinker, and he threw it 22 percent of the time. I think cut the sinker. Yeah, well, well guess what? He can't because he, his arsenal isn't unique enough. Also, he has not a single offering with a whiff percentage over 30. And you talk about the splitter being a great pitch. If it's so good, why does he only throw it a tenth of the time? It, like thirteen percent. What thirteen percent? Okay, it's no, you're right though. You're right though. It's it's legitimately a tenth of the time. He's only going into it to it that frequently. Like that's a pitch that if it's if it's one of the better pitches in baseball, he's got to use it more, and he's not because when he was using it more, hitters adjusted to it. I am just not. I'm not high on Mize. I think he's a big league starter. He's a back end of the rotation guy. I mean, he gave up five or more homers on three different offerings. Like, that's just that's just alarming to me. I, I'm just I'm just not a I'm just not a fan. Yeah, Scooble Jack. is to me the best, and and Manning got called up because he couldn't figure it out in AAA, so they wanted to get him major league help. He was getting shelled in AAA. I, I'm, I'm not trying to mash, bash the Tigers. I love the Tigers, but I think we're we're giving that rotation too much credit. Uh, before they they really put it together here, like they those guys flop. Now what? You spent two hundred or three hundred million on Carlos Correa, and your your only reliable starter is Eduardo Rodriguez and maybe Tarek Skubal. Uh, yeah, I just I just think it's risky for them. I don't I don't I don't think they're as far along as they think they are. That's interesting. Like Jack, I mean, it's got this splitter. It's supposed to be the greatest, but twenty one percent whiff rate. It's fine. All of his pitches in terms of the spin, it's on like the twentieth percentile of spin rate. Now the pitches are that good. It, but I understand what you're saying because I turn on a Tigers game and I watch Casey Mize and I look at a good pitcher. Like I'm watching a good pitcher. It's because you just, it's cause, you just it's totally you switched your allegiance, Peter. I thought oh. you were with me. I know. Well, because I'm not, I'm not going to just jump off the boat. I'm not. I still like him. And I still think he will progress. But what I'm saying has a ton of validity because it's like he just – all of his expected stuff, the spin, a lot of the stuff besides just the ERA, he wasn't good. I was just like, just, what does he excel at? What does he excel at? And also, I think the, here's the thing. I, I love Jack, but Jack has a college bias. And I think every time my pitches, he squints and he sees the Auburn jersey on him. And that's well, why he yeah, loves I it. Do. And yeah, that's I the do. problem. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, and listen, I'm not going to go eat gravel. Um, but I am certainly going to gravel. I don't know. This is I'm a weird gonna, one. Don't worry. Um, don't worry. here's the thing I, out of us three, I'm probably, um, the most outdated in my thinking. I look at the advanced stats. I like the advanced stats, but I don't, um, I don't adhere to them as much. And that's not like, I'm not saying I'm high and mighty right now. I'm just saying like, I'm probably a little bit flawed because I look at those and I don't put as much stock as a lot of other people do now. Um, part of my, or part of my belief that Casey Mize is going to figure it out and be an ace is because of Chris Fetter, who's the pitching coach for the Detroit Tigers, who I think is a top five pitching coach in Major League Baseball. So I think if you've got that stuff and you've got that command that he obviously has, Chris Fetter can tailor Casey Mize to the way that it best, it best benefits him, best benefits the Tigers. You know what I mean? So like it might be a little bit outdated to rely on the pitching coach to help fix a pitcher because at the end of the day, the pitcher is the one that's got to figure shit out on their own. But I am relying on the pitching coach a little bit to fix who I think is an otherworldly talent when he's right. I agree. Um, otherworldly talent when he's right. One final, one final thought on that. Um, Jack, where do you think he rank, ranked in Major League Baseball among starting pitchers in whiff rate? Or not, sorry, all pitchers in whiff rate, excuse me. All pitchers and whiff rate. I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess bottom quarter now that you yeah, just but, gave me all the info. Yeah, 276th. Well, behind many? Eli Morgan. Well, Eli Morgan sometimes would put in a good start when I bet against him, so I hate him. Behind Vladimir Gutierrez. Chris oh, Boone. Vladimir Gutierrez is not too bad. Yeah, he was good. And he's I saw, him, Gant. I saw him on video, too, working out. Trevor Williams. Ross oh, Detweiler. Bad. He's okay, stop that. saying names. Let's <laughs> move on to Cindergard and Verlander. Okay. Um, they've got interesting <laughs> contracts. 
Justin Verlander had his contract broken by his brother, Ben Verlander. That was an inside source of all inside sources. One year, 25 with a player option, one year, 25. It's the LeBron deal, right? It's keep signing one plus ones. Verlander just commit to $25 million in his age 39 season, having thrown how many innings in the last two years? Yeesh. Not that many. He got it was paid. funny. He got paid, and it kind of relates to the Noah Syndergaard because he got 25, Syndergaard got 21. And I think Verlander was looking for 20, saw Syndergaard get 21, went back to his camp and said, we should get more, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah, the shoe dropped right after that. Yeah, it's probably yeah. not a coincidence. And now Max Scherzer is just salivating. And, oh and you know, he might just, get 40. I think he's going to get 35, 37. Three years, 90. I mean, I said four years, 120 at one point. I think he <laughs> might get, get three years, 105. I, I, I think he's going to get two years with an option. Two years, 100. Like two years, two years, legitimately 70, $75 million, something like that, with an Ooh. option. Um, and, and I love it. I love it. And, and, and you know what the crazy thing about it all is? I don't know about you guys, but you talk about Verlander not pitching for, for almost two years. And we saw Thor throw a little bit, even though he wasn't allowed to throw sliders, which was bizarre. Bizarre. Are you not more confident in signing Justin Verlander at 30, what is he, 39 years old now, than yep. in, his, in his health holding up yep. than Noah Syndergaard? Not even close. Like, does that say more about Verlander or more more about Syndergaard? I more think, about Verlander, I think. I, me, I, I me still too. think Verlander could be a legit ace in this league. Legit He's modern-day Nolan Ryan. He's modern-day Nolan Ryan. Shut up with that. Um, he is yeah. modern-day Nolan Ryan. Who else is throwing that hard until they're 39, 40 years old? Was Nolan Ryan doing that? Yeah, I know he was doing it in, like, his early to mid-30s. He was throwing that hard when he was, like, 39. 46. <laughs> I knew he threw forever. Was he still at like a hundred when he was like 43, 95, 96 throwing Damn. cheese and Damn. beating the shit out of uh, <laughs> Robert Natura. Yeah. I've got a signed photo of that from, uh, that's fire. Yeah. From Nolan. That's, that's uh, I should have known his. I should have known his velo. Do you know his spin rate in, yeah. in his early forties by chance? Shit. He's a bad pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> Zero Cy Youngs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, most overrated. I'm not going to say it. Um, yeah, I mean, Verlander, like, I think it's a testament to both of them, skewing positive for Verlander, skewing negative for Syndergaard. Syndergaard, there is zero guarantee that he can do anything right yeah. now. Like, he didn't throw a slider when he came back. Like, so weird. How, how does that stipulation make its way into a Major League Baseball game? Hey, you are at the pinnacle of this sport that you have worked your ass off to get to for the sake of your health. When you come back, we're not going to let you throw maybe your best pitch. Like what? Just don't and come it, back. It just shows that he can like spontaneously combust at any time. Like, or I it think shows what, the Mets have no idea what they're doing. Well, I just think there's a lot of dysfunction. <laughs> I do. I am happy that he's in a new environment because we saw the, the DeGrom stuff. Look, I'm not a doctor. I'm not, I'm no expert. But there's just so you could just tell when something's off and the DeGrom thing, right? Like I, we, we've talked about that, Peter, too. Like I remember like we were on the subway and we were talking about it. And it's like, this is all weird the way it was weird. all unfolding. And, and Syndergaard, the whole situation has been weird, too. Matt Harvey, super weird, too, the way a lot of it unfolded. Uh, obviously, it's hard to pinpoint blame on an organization for, for arm issues for pitchers because everybody has them. But I think it's objectively true, just like anecdotally, that the, that the Mets have had some bizarre arm issues and ways of handling it with their star, star pitchers. How about Zach Wheeler? He couldn't stay Wheeler. on the field in Queens, and then he goes to Philly and he throws 210 innings. Yeah, he's, missed, he's Iron Man now. It, it makes no sense. Makes no sense. Although and it might yes. make sense if you do a deep dive into the Mets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's weird. Um who took out the insurance policy on Harvey's arm? Was it Boris that took out the policy or was it the Mets? I'm hmm. trying to remember. Do you remember? Somebody took out an Boris. insurance policy I, on like, Harvey's arm. I think arm. it, when you said, I think it's Boris. I'm going to look it up. I think so too. I, I wouldn't um, that thing. Pete, while you look that up, let's talk about Brandon Belt accepting the qualifying offer. Arm, I'll throw to you first. Like the qualifying offer is one that, wait, was Belt the second or third guy ever to accept the qualifying offer? <laughs> I mean, he's the second giant he's in, in two years, right? I mean, we had Kevin Gossman accept it last year, and 
Brandon Belt accepts it this year. I'm, I'm glad he did. Uh, we also had, of course, last year, Marcus Stroman accepted it. So the recent track record shows that the guys that have accepted it have, have turned it into or parlayed it into a good opportunity in free agency. I think we're going to see Stroman get paid. We're going to see Gosman get paid. Belt's a little bit more unique because he's 33 years old. But because he missed time, I think that's the only reason why we're seeing him sign this, uh, this qualifying offer. If he didn't miss the end of the season and, and played a full year, I think he probably would have ultimately – found his way into just regular free agency and seeing if he could get three plus years, but now he has just been hurt. So consecutively he's taking it. I think he's going to go into free agency at 34 years old, uh, closer to 35 as a power hitting first baseman with potentially the universal DH and have more teams at his disposal. At that point, the guy rakes, he's hitting as well as he ever has in his career. I like this bet on himself. And especially with the, the, you know, DH most likely coming. Since the qualifying offer was implemented, there have been 110 guys that have been extended the qualifying offer. Belt was the 11th to accept the qualifying offer. I named three of them. Uh, I wonder who else there was. So I saw Jose Abreu accepted the qualifying offer, but replaced it with that three-year $50 million deal. So Uh I think that's happened before where you accept it and then just renegotiate with the team that you're with. Pete, do you have an answer? To Yeah, it was Scott Boris. It was Boris. Scott Boris took it out. Brendan Belt's kind of really underrated free agent that was available that I was looking at. I was like thinking possibly the Yankees would might want him instead of a Matt Olson, not instead of a Matt Olson, but I thought he could fill in really nice. I mean, Aram talk about the WRC plus Brandon Belt yeah. since 2020. Well, I mean, he's a kind of an incredible hitter. Yeah. I mean, he does damage. He absolutely does damage and he walks, he, he does it all. He, when we pulled that stat from the beginning of 2020, he's, top three in baseball in WRC plus. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And that's somebody that the the giants I think are really excited to get back, especially after Posey retired and cleared up a little bit of money for them. At least obviously they'd much rather have Posey back, but that is a lot of money that is clearing off. Uh, And now you, you make sure that you bring back belt. You've got Crawford and they've got to figure out the pitching now. Their pitching is, is thin. Thin, thin, thin if Kevin Gossman doesn't come back. Uh, and that's where I think that money is going to be allocated towards. So I'm glad they got their their bat back in the lineup. I don't think they're going to invest that much more in their offense. I think it's going to be mostly on, on the starting pitching. I think it's a good plan for them too. I would. Logan Webb and then who? Yeah. Scary. How about Freddie Freeman? Yeah. Trouble I in paradise. I, I just can't imagine – I didn't even want to write a free agent. I'm not even surprised. I didn't even want a free agent pre- preview on him because I was like, that guy's not going anywhere. He can't go anywhere. It's like against the rules. It's like Dwayne Wade leaving the heat for, for the bulls. Well, I was, they kept rumoring it. And I was like, they kept saying, Oh yeah. D Wade's meeting with the bulls. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Whatever. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. He's meeting with other teams. Sure. And then he was gone. And I, and part of me died. And I hope that's not the case with, with Freddie Freeman and the Braves because I just can't see that guy anywhere else. Is anyone there's, surprised that the Braves are doing this? There's yes. just like this, this fundamental disagreement between the two on length and money. Like for the most part, it's length. The Braves don't want to give him the long deal. Freddie Freeman, if anybody has deserved a long deal, it's this guy. Also – what are his skills that are going to teeter off as he gets older? He's not a speed guy. The power. That's, he's never been like the 40 home run guy. Right. He's, he's just a gap to gap hitter. That's just, just going to keep translating. And he's a champion. Now. What are we doing here? Atlanta. Right. Like what deteriorates as he gets older? I have no idea. I understand That's- if you're going to say maybe Starling Marte who relies on his speed, looking forward, to giving him some type of extension, even though, we're hearing the scuttlebutt on Starling Marte. I think 12 teams are interested. This is one of the most coveted free agents, Starling Marte. But I'm he's interested. also, and as you should be, but he's a guy whose speed could teeter off. He stole 54 bases last year. Does he continue to do that into his mid thirties? But a guy like Freddie, who's years younger and already in Atlanta. Like, what are we doing? Makes no sense. I, I really hope that it's just posturing. Six years, yeah, it's going to go into what is age 37 season. Uh, maybe who cares? Do we have an exact offer 
from Atlanta, what they've it's, done yet. All we know is the sixth year. Yeah. And that to me is, is just bizarre because I mean, that's somebody that, that represents so much more than just what he's going to do on the field. And I highly doubt is going to be such a liability that you're like, Oh my gosh, why, why are we, why are we still paying this guy? Yeah. Like when is that going to go even wrong? Even if you're platooning him at age 37, yeah. his leadership, and he won't be. what he brings in the clubhouse. I mean, it, it, there's just so much value there that he deserves the extra year just because of how, how much he's given the Braves franchise, especially with the icing on the cake being this championship. The, there's no guarantee whatsoever that Freddie Freeman can be the equivalent to Joey Votto, but Joey Votto is 38 years old. He just played his age 37 season. Like he didn't look tired and senile. Like he, he looked fine. Looked totally fine. He still bangs and so does Freddie. Let's wrap up with the Cy Young conversation. It was Robbie Ray and Corbin Burns. All three of us thought that Garrett Cole should win the Cy Young. If we had a ballot, we would vote for Cole first. Robbie Ray ran away with the AL Cy Young, which was weird. We thought that he could win it. We didn't think that he would win it in a landslide like he did. Why is that? I mean, I think... I think we're in a really weird transitional point in, in the way that we are judging these things, because you have, you have the advanced, you know, the advanced statistics, which are obviously a huge part of the game. And now the writers are, are using it uh, very much so too to judge. Uh, but then you also have still the, the semblance of traditionalism with some of the older writers and still just general writers wanting to be a hybrid of the two. That's okay but it, it leaves a lot of gray area area and ambiguity. And I think that this Cy Young award from both sides is a perfect example of it. You have Corbin Burns on one side, who is an analytics wet dream and has done legitimately everything that you, you could want to check all of those analytics boxes, but he only threw 167 innings. He was so dominant in so many of those important metrics that he won. Then you go to the AL. And Garrett Cole was, was better in a lot of the metrics by a decent margin. Then you still have all the counting stats for Robbie Ray, ERA, strikeouts, uh, you know, whip. Innings. Innings. And innings. And innings. And he wins it. So to me, there's like a juxtaposition between these two awards. One was like the more traditionalist philosophy, and then the other was more of the modern take on it. And look, I don't agree. I don't disagree with either. Like, I'm okay with Ray, and, and, and I'm – I said Burns was the guy, uh, but I, I do think that it's a little bit interesting given how dramatic the voting ended up as to where we are and what our reasoning is of these awards. And I think fielding independent pitching is maybe just a better indicator of success than ERA is. And that's not an expected stat. No. That's what happened. And the fact of the matter is Robbie Ray and Jordan Montgomery had the same FIP this year. That's just what it was. Not only, I'll, let's go through the categories because we, Ray won in innings, strikeouts, ERA. ERA. Garrett Cole led in expected ERA. He led in FIP. He led in XFIP. He led in Sierra. He led in K per nine. He led in walks per nine. He, he led in strikeout rate, in walk rate, in K minus BB rate, in, in F war. There's all, there's just like so many stats. I'm not going to go, but he won in all of them, like all of them, except those specific counting numbers, but those specific counting numbers are result based. I'm not pissed that Ray won it, but I do think Cole deserved it, but I don't know where I'm at. The, the weird thing is that Wheeler obviously had the volume and the thing about it, though, is, and I thought somebody brought up a really good point, and um, I believe it was Jeremy Frank, and he was saying, yeah, you, you can say that Zach Wheeler should have, you know, Zach Wheeler threw 40 whatever more innings, but at the same time, he also, you know, if you got those 40-something innings out of Corbin Burns to match Wheeler, he would have had to only strike out 13 batters and give up like a ton of runs at like a four or five ERA. And his numbers would have been equivalent to Wheeler. So we know he wouldn't have been that bad. I know he didn't throw those innings, 
but he, to have the same stat line as Wheeler, he would have had to suck for 46 innings straight. Uh, like, I think that is worth kind of mentioning is if like, it's almost like a sliding scale. How much more did you do volume wise versus how dominant were you in the shorter, smaller sample? And the reality is for their numbers to be equivalent, Corbin Burns would have had to be, be like the worst pitcher in baseball for those 46 innings. And I think that's, that's worth something and worth noting. Yeah. I'm glad that Wheeler got the first place votes that he did just because, you know, that, that shows a little bit. It, it just shows that innings still matter a teensy bit, like workload matters. And he, and he worked a shit ton. Like he was constantly on the mound and he was throwing seven innings, eight innings, but they got it right with Corbin Burns. Like you're saying, he would have had to suck to be equivalent to Zach Wheeler. If you have that small of a sample size relative to the other candidate for that, you just have to be so inarguably better. And that's what Corbin Burns was. You know, with with the Blake Snell thing, he was not so inarguably better than Justin Verlander the year he won the AL Cy Young. But that wasn't the case with Corbin Burns. He was just the best pitcher in the National League, and there wasn't much of a question. That's what I was thinking. Folks, I got some good info. Who do you think just won the NL MVP? Bryce. It'd be Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper just won the NL MVP. Yes. Yes. I don't know if it's announced yet, but per source. Bryce Harper. And also another thing on Shohei, William Hill Sportsbook is due to lose $900,000 on a singular bet for Shohei Otani to win the American League MVP which is basically a lock at this point, a $30,000 bet to win 900 grand at the beginning of the year. If you Shohei put, wins MVP, you put $30,000 on Shohei. No, I didn't do MVP. shit. I'm just saying someone else did 30,000. Wow. What are we talking you about? That? And that's a prop. Imagine what that guy's putting on the actual game, but Peter, regardless. Wow. Crazy. That's a big break for the Just Baseball show. Peter Apple just took home $900,000 on Shohei Thank Otani. You. To win Thank you. Game. I will take all, all compliments. No criticism. Yeah. All Dang. of it. Yeah, that was you. I didn't listen to the rest of it. I just know that that was you that put it down. Um, that's it on my list. What do you guys got? Anything you want to say bye? Aram, what's your next top 10 that's dropping? Yankees tomorrow. Or I guess today, 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 when, when people are listening, Yankees will be out. Give us a follow on Twitter. I'm at Peter Apple 23. That's Jack underscore McMullen 11. That's arm Layton eight. You can find the Yankees top 10 prospects on just baseball.com. You can find our all MLB team also on just baseball.com and all over socials at just baseball fans on Instagram and TikTok. Also, you can find our new merch use code fade jack to get 15 percent. we're still fading jack we're still getting 15 percent. also the new postseason shirt by pillbox batco also is down to 18 dollars and 29 cents from 28 dollars. all of that information is in the episode description thank you everybody